Good evening, this is Rahul Reddy. Today we are live here from Houston, Texas. Along with me is uh, Emily Newman. Today we are going to discuss about working for two employer mechanics if you are on H1B, but if you are on AOS EAD, or if you are in H4 EAD. We are going to discuss about that. We are going to also discuss about studying on H4 or F1, which is better. Uh, there are some pluses and minus. We want you to understand both the things and evaluate and make a decision on that. Um, the premium processing has started for certain EB1C, uh, that is for multinational executives, and also EB2 national interest waiver, I-140 petitions. Is that something they did a good job or not? Emily has some not so good remarks about that. We'll discuss it. Uh, Interfile uh, to uh, to transfer underlying business from E2 is it working? Uh, we have some good news about interfiling for sure after a long, long time. Emily, um, most of the people now uh, they're working from home um, on H1B. Can they work for two companies at the same time? Yes, so that is allowed uh, when you're on H1B, and the only requirement is that you have to have an, an H1B petition from both companies, and it's called concurrent employment. So you have your H1B typically with company A, you have that petition approved, and now you want to start working for company B at the same time. Company B has to file a concurrent H1B petition. It's just a one box to check that says concurrent instead of change of employer, but everything else is just like a regular H1B. So let's say I'm working for company A, Emily, and now company B says that they're going to file concurrently file. That means that they know I'm going to work with company A and uh, I'm going to work for company B. Is there any obligation that I have to inform the company A that I'm working for company B? Not from an immigration standpoint. Can um, can I work for both the companies full time, 40 hours and 40 hours? Yep, if you can survive that, more power to you. <laughs> um, how about if I'm working for one company, can I work for two clients at the same time? Yeah, and that's kind of a different aspect. So there, there's only one employer, so nothing really changes. It's just your employer's giving you an additional assignment. So as long as your LCA covers that work location and the job duties are the same, um, really nothing needs to be done in that situation. What will happen if I'm working for company A and company B? When I go to the consulate, what will happen? Can I get from both H1Bs? How does the mechanism work? Yeah, that's where it gets a little tricky because there's zero guidance anywhere from USCIS or the Department of State about this. So typically when you're going for stamping, it only lets you put in one receipt number in the DS-160 form. So you're going to be getting a visa stamp from one employer, not, not both. Um, so you choose which employer you're going to go for stamping for. And then when you come into the country, you're showing that employer's visa and that employer's H-1B approval notice. They're going to give you an I-94 that's tied to that employer. Um, there's no guidance about what happens to your other petition. So to be on the safe side, once you re-enter with company A, um, we would recommend filing again your uh, concurrent employment because it's very unclear whether that travel and re-entry on only company A's H-1B, which is the only thing that's allowed for you to do, what does that do to your company B concurrent employment? Because that has your old I-94 number on it. Um, so that so travel with two concurrent H-1Bs can be a little tricky, might require some extra filings, but it's doable. And Emily, will there be any problem for people who work on two employers and getting the green card? As long as you have the um, H-1B approvals for concurrent employment, no problem at all. I mean, I want to discuss about a lot of people tend to, uh, when they are on H-4 visa, and especially, and they want to study though, they think that they have to move to F-1. Is it required for them to move to F-1 visa to study? No, it's not. That's one great thing about H-4, um, L-2 as well. Um, you do have the opportunity to study. Um, while you're in H-4 status, it does not conflict with your H-4 or L-2 status. The only thing is you can't work, you can't take any summer internships or that sort of thing that are part of your program unless you have an H-4 EAD. It's a very big debate that pops up, uh, Emily. A lot of these people that they come in, they try to think that, okay, F-1 is to get the employment authorization. But of course, if the spouse has I-140 approval, they can get an employment authorization too. Nowadays, they have shown flexibility about extension by 540 days, and we know how to hack the system to get these people extended by 540 days. I personally, though, don't feel any need why these people have to move to F-1 visa, though. 
Um, and also when they move to F1 visa, they have to pay out of state tuition, even though they are residing in Texas, for example, and they've been there for two years, they have to still get the, uh, they have to still pay the out of state tuition in F1 visa. That's one of the reason why I don't like F1 visa personally though. Uh, the, the employment authorization, as you said, is rightfully so. But of course, if the spouse gets an I-140 approval, they get an EAD. The EAD of the H-4, H4 has no conditions attached to it, while the OPT and STEM extension has a lot of conditions attached to that. That's another reason I personally don't like F-1 visa. The third reason I don't like F-1 visa is, hey, whenever you go outside the country, you have to get the stamping and come back. And especially when the spouse is here on H-1B though, uh, when you're going, you have to show an F-1 visa has to show their intention is that after they complete the education, they're going to go back while the spouse is working in the United States. And that stamping also becomes a lot of issue. That's another reason I don't like uh, uh, I, I don't like to go to student visa. In fact, personally, Emily, when I was an H-4 visa though, I was studying, I was studying. Uh, and I didn't, I did not choose to go to F1 visa because I thought of all these disadvantages. Why should I do it? I just go to college and enroll myself. And I said, look, I'm residing in Texas from past one year. Here is a proof. You allow me as a, as a resident, I don't have to pay the extra double the fees as a non-state student though. So I was allowed to do it. Uh, that's what I advise people, but I they tend to go with F1 because and all those things. Now, uh, a lot of people also ask this question, Emily, is that on H4, for example, if they graduate and get the master's degree, are they eligible for the master's quota or they have to be in student visa to be eligible? For the yeah, master's? that's a very common question. And yes, you're eligible for the master's quota. Um, so you don't have to be in F1 status in order to qualify for the master's cap. It just requires that you have a U.S. master's degree from a qualified school, but you don't have to be a student in F1 status to qualify for it. And Emily, any other questions before I move to the third topic? Okay. Um, Yahoo! Now the premium processing is out for especially the EB1C people who have been waiting for a long period of time. Is this a good news for our clients though? Well, when I first read it, I was very excited because it said starting June 1st, you can upgrade pending EB1C I-140s. And then starting July 1st, you can upgrade pending NIW I-140s. And I actually forwarded it to a couple of my clients who had pending applications hey, and were give waiting the, for this. Give me the 2,500, I'll file the premium process. And then I read the fine print that you can only do this if the EB1C was filed before January 1st, 2021. So that means 17 months before they must have filed the 485 for EB1C. Right. But processing time is only 14 months, Emily. Exactly. So this is how many how people do, have how do, their... If the processing time is only 14 months, they're telling us to file the premium processing. What does that tell you? That these processing times are completely inaccurate um, and that the I-140 premium processing expansion is going to be this tiny percentage of people who have applications still pending from January 2021. Only those people can upgrade right now. So very few people are going to have that opportunity. And remember, this premium processing is not 15 days. It's 45 days. Oh. So you might get the approval in the next 45 days anyways, if yours happens to be pending that I long, don't but... trust immigration yeah. on their processing <laughs> time. Why? I Not only I don't trust, they don't trust their own processing time. So if i am been waiting for January of 2021, Emily, I'm not going to believe on saying that it's going to be approved. Eventually within 45 days, I won't trust it. I will go with premium processing, what do you say? No, I agree with uh, you. Also, yeah. I feel that this is a baby step towards probably they will try to decrease the time. Um, maybe they'll bring it time to as much as immediately when we're filing, because if they open up the door for all the premium processing though, all the people are going to go for premium processing. They don't have enough personal to handle it. And that's the reason I feel that they're gradually are going to improve that from January of 2021. And they may come to the present, I hope so, in the next six months, that's what I'm assuming, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how would EB, uh, EB2 national interest waiver? All people already know that they can do premium processing in EB2 and EB3, whatever national interest waiver. Emily. Yeah, so that will become available July 1st, but again, only for those with uh, petitions that have been pending for, I, I forget the date on that one, if it's um, January 1st or March 31st. We March, were some, March, 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 yeah. So if it was filed before March of 2021, 
in that case, then you're eligible to upgrade to premium processing again with that 45 day time frame and the $2,500 filing fee. It's a, but what you just said, Emily, I thought premium processing is one, two, two, five. Uh, this one is $2,500. Oh, actually, the H1 is also yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. The premium processing fees has gone up, so it's $2,500, and it's 45 days for EB1. But I, I still believe if you qualify for it, it's still worth for you to go ahead and do the premium processing because otherwise they're going to take a long time because all these officers will now work on premium processing. They're not going to work on regular processing, though. Uh, Emily, is there any good news? Uh, because uh, in January of 2022, they came up with a, uh, upgrading to EB2. Um, you know, as we know that USCIS uh, and State Department told us uh, there are many applicants in EB2. So we're going to move the priority date of EB3 to January of 2015. And then they realized that, oops, that's not true. There are more applicants in EB3. Now they're telling upgrade it to EB2 and they, and we were trying to upgrade it. And they said they have created a system where they've created an address in uh, in January of 2022 in California and we started filing in California to upgrade to EB2. Any good news that is going on at least? Yeah, so we did get some information from USCIS on this and what their plan is with these applications. So they told us last week that from that January 2022 through May 11th, 2022, they received 11,700 mailings at that California Western Form Center address. So 11,700 packages of these special interfile requests. Now, of course, you know, it took them months to issue receipt notices, confirming receipt of all those. They're finally getting uh, on track with that. But they also confirmed that of those 11,700, they have been able to get to 5,000 of them and make them electronically available to the officer to actually adjudicate the application. That means that the file of 485G supplement doesn't have to be transferred to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, local office or wherever the file is pending. Mm -hmm. That's electronically available. That means that if you file the medical, that may not reach because they may not have the system. Exactly, yeah. So don't interfile your medical with your transfer. And, and another cases. thing is that in this week, that means in the past four or five days though, we have noticed a couple of uh, interfiling cases getting approved um, that were actually uh, interfiled from EB3 to EB2 using the 485J supplement. That is the good news coming for the interfiling thing at this point of time. So uh, it, you can still debate whether you want to file in the interfile or refile, that's up to you. Uh, but interfile is not as bad as what we said in March of 2022. It is a little bit better right now, but keep watching us um, every week so that you can take a decision on whether you want to refile or interfile uh, or you want to do both. You know, sometimes you, it may be worth for you to do both. Anything, anything else simply before we go to questions? Um, yeah, so this uh, information about the interfiles came from the USCIS stakeholder engagement that happened last week. I think I had mentioned it last Tuesday that it took forever to get started and then didn't happen. I had a bad connection apparently. They were able to actually proceed with it and today they actually shared it on YouTube. So if you're on Twitter, you can go to my Immigration Girl um, Twitter handle and I shared uh, a link to that YouTube video where you can see them talk about this 11,500 or 11,700 mailers coming in and 5,000 of them have been electronically made available. They also talk about the um, green card waste issue that they're aware of that they're and they're talking about the different things that they've been doing to try to avoid that same thing from happening this year. So there are some good updates on there. Um, questions that came from uh, Uma Girish. Uh, she wrote letters to the senators or congressmen. That's very good. Thank you very much. You did a very good job. Can L1B apply for EB1C if the criteria are met? Yes. You don't have to be an L1A visa to apply for EB1C. You could be on H1, you could be an L1, you could be an H4. If you meet the criteria, which you know it is that you must be in a multinational executive position, you must have worked for the company previously in India in a very higher level position. Yes, you can file EB1C. One thing I would suggest to you is that go and apply for EB2 because sometimes EB1C is a little bit risky. It may be approved, it may be denied. 
I would always file a EB2 and EB1C, both if that's allowed. Uh, but if they say only one, then probably I'll choose only EB1C. Um, Anoop says, my 485 has been pending at NBC since January 2022. What options do I have to move my case since they don't allow us to submit service requests? Yeah, there are no options. Um, because the case is considered within normal processing time, you can't do a service request. Um, you, for that same reason, you also cannot seek assistance from your senator or congr congressman's office on your actual case. You may try an ombudsman request. You may try to chat with Emma to see if she can give you any information about what's going on with the case. But this is why that we request you to send letters to your senators and congressmen asking them to make sure USCIS processes these applications and does not waste them this year like they did last year. That's all we can do because litigation, uh, we don't have that capability quite yet. Still waiting on some more data before we're able to proceed with, um, with that option. Um, unfortunately, not much can be done. Venkat is asking question that he wrote later to the congressman for Margarita visa, that Mar Margarita switch of automatic revalidation. To get the H4 I 84 extension, do we need a visit visa to Mexico? Yes, uh, especially if you are flying in, you will require a visit visa. Now, let the, there's a little bit back up here. Let's say, for example, if your current visa is expiring in July 2022, visa stamping, okay? Then if you're going to Mexico, you don't need a visa because what they're telling is that as long as you have a stamped visa that is valid to come back into the United States, you don't need a visa to go to Mexico. But if your visa has expired and you're traveling based to based on the I-797 and then you want to extend it, though, you would require a visa, especially if you are flying to Mexico. Um, Sam Deep says some October 2020 applicants for EAD still haven't been processed yet. What are ways in which we can force USCIS to process them? Now that is something that we can manage and that is litigation. Um, we are filing lawsuits for delay in what we call these interim benefits, which are the EAD and AP applications associated with the 485. So courts are hesitant to force USCIS to adjudicate the 485 within a certain period of time. But the EAD, because those processing times are so long, and that is a work permit that you need to be able to work, we have seen success in litigating those. So you can reach out to our office. Stephen Brown is the attorney that's handling those. Um, Kamlesh uh, Hassan uh, has this question. Uh, when would the second quarter statistics will be released by USC? I'm sure he's speaking about I-485. Now, second quarter ended in March 13th. There is a first item on March 30th of 2022. Unfortunately, the statistics will be released only in June of 2022. So that's the bad news for us, though. Um, Ravi Kiran wants to know if I can still use my priority date from 2012 since it's already been current since last December. I heard that I can't use it after one year of my priority date becoming current. I get this question a lot. I think there's a lot of confusion on it. And it's because of consular processing. If you have your I-140 petition approved for consular processing and they send it to the National Visa Center and your date becomes current and the NVC contacts you to start the process and they don't hear from you for an entire year, they will terminate the process. That's consular processing if you're doing your green card from outside the US. That is not the same if you're inside the US and it does not impact your ability to keep the priority date. So you may not be able to use that I-140 if the, you know, you're no longer with that employer or that job's no longer available or the company doesn't exist anymore, but the priority date stays yours forever for any subsequent I-140 petition filed on your behalf. Question for, uh, 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 from the Sushmita. Can H-4 holder work before October 2020? H-1B visa lottery picked and approved uh, with the October 1st start date of 2022. Sushmita, if you do not have an H-4 EAD, even though your H-1B is approved with October 1st start date, you cannot start working until October 1st. Um, Neelam Royan says, I downgraded to EB-3 in October 2020 and that I-140 is still pending. 
My EB2 is approved and I'm planning to enter file in June. Will the pending EB3 I-140 create a problem? My employer is not ready to do premium processing. So in the um, most recent guidance from USCIS on this issue, you can enter file to port your 485 from a pending I-140 to a approved I-140. As long as your pending I-140 remains pending on the day your enter file is received. If your I-140 were to be unexpectedly denied before your enter file reaches USCIS, then it won't work. Or if that I-140 gets withdrawn or revoked before your enter file is actually filed and received, that's going to be a problem. But as long as it's pending, it works. Kishore has this question. Um, very good question. He wrote a letter to uh, North Carolina Senator. Thank you very much. He, he traveled an advanced parole, but when he got back, the I-94 was only given for one year. What happens after one year if the AOS is still pending? Nothing will happen. You're fine. You're in legal status. You can ignore only this time, never any other time, only in this case, advanced parole. You're coming back. Your I-94 expires in one year. You're perfectly legal to stay after that one year. Now, this is only for advanced parole, employment-based advanced parole I-94. Don't confuse this with any other I-94, guys. Um, Raja says, can an H-4 EAD person work for one full-time and one contractor job or vice versa? Will it have any impact on the working hours per day or are there any restrictions for the H-4? You absolutely can do that. You can be a W-2 employee for one job and an independent contractor for the other. Doesn't matter. You can work as many hours as you want for one, as many hours as you want for the other. There are no restrictions on the H-4 EAD as long as it is a legal job in the state where you're working. Yes, P. I have applied I-140 in January 2021, but the case is still, is still pending. How long it will take for the I-140 process? Uh, in Texas Service Center, they're processing the cases filed in October of 2020. So you're about three months, but that's not how it's work with the Texas Service Center. Sometimes from processing time from September to October, they took almost one year for one month. So what I would suggest you is to file the premium processing. And the good news for a lot of other people though who are listening to it, that um, Texas Service Center, Nebraska Service Center is accepting the premium processings for all the cases, the downgrade applications. Previously, we used to get almost 60% rejections. We used to keep refile and refile, only premium processing. But now they have accepted all of our cases. There are some exceptions to the cases where, you know, they have moved unnecessarily to the National Benefit Center before the I-140 approved. But other than those uh, one or two cases, all premium processing have been accepted. So it is very uh, good for you to file a premium processing. Mita Rana has this question. Can I apply 485 with old employer and not work for them? Yes, you can. Yeah, they can file a 485 even though you are not working for that company. Um, Keta says the downgrade to EB3 was filed in October 2020 and he got an RFE on that I-140 to submit the original labor certification. His attorney is saying there's a very less chance of approval. So what is the strategy to answer this RFE? Well, what USCIS is asking for is impossible because the original approval, you don't have it, your employer doesn't have it. Guess who has it? USCIS. Um, it's a training issue. They just need to explain to the officer that USCIS has the original. It was filed in this other I-140 petition. I'm assuming it was filed in your previous EB2 I-140 petition. Give those details, tell them to go get that I-140 um, petition and get the labor certification original out of that file, or they can request it from the labor department. The labor department can send a new original straight to USCIS. There's nothing cause co for concern here. It's just more of a training issue from the officer. Uh, Arun Singh uh, Rajaputra, can H-4 child can do masters with H-4 status? Wow. Uh -huh. Uh, that's very fast that the child under 21 has reached to the master's degree. That's I, that happens, you know, the kids are smarter nowadays. Um, yes, they can do master's also on H4 status. Absolutely not a problem. Uh, Ramesh says you received an RFE for the derivative applicant asking to interfile. Is this normal? 
what's to be done here? The primary applicant already did the inner filing and the receipt was received. No, it's not normal. Again, it's a training issue. Now, in that uh, stakeholder engagement, USCIS confirmed that they are only operating at 80% of their pr preferred staffing level, and they are trying to ramp up to hire about 4,000 employees to get up to 100%. So you can imagine there's going to be some new officers or some officers that are covering different cases that maybe they didn't before. Um, so it sounds like it's a training issue just need to explain that this is the derivative the primary applicant already did inner file here's a copy of what we submitted here's a copy of that 485j receipt shouldn't have any problems um questions are coming on 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 uh from Vidan eva um have she has uh, he has earned a doctor of physical therapy while working for the same employer does it qualify under eb2 yes yes it qualifies under EB2. There are many ways to document it, not a big issue at all. Especially for physical therapists, it's much easier compared to the other people because of the labor certification requirement is not there. Uh, it's very easy, I-140 for them compared to others. Maybe getting to the point that he got it while he was at that company. So. I know, I know, but that's the reason I said, because the physical therapy, there are different positions. Mm -hmm. He may have moved up, he or she may have moved up to the higher level position. So they can still document because doctors of physical therapy may be doing much better work than the masters and bachelor students. But it's, as compared to the labor department, they don't have to go through that. It may be much easier. That's my thought. Okay. My GC approved uh, uh, Swari Rajan Balakrishnan, but I haven't received my card yet. Can I do the international travel enter the country? with the advance parole um yes you can actually <laughs> that's surprising um what we noticed swarajan is that uh, uh, green cards are uh, that are approved though they're getting to the po boxes within like uh, the, the, getting to the uh, mail of your thing like within a week's time they're coming so i would like you to have somebody check your uh, uh, mail and FedEx it to you, that would be much better rather than coming an advanced parole though, but you can technically come an advanced parole too. Um, the only thing is that when you come an advanced parole, they will take you to the small room because you got a green card approval, they may wait, may, may, they may make you wait for a little bit of time. I would use, uh, I would try to use their resources very less and try to FedEx my green card, that would be more easier rather than putting a stress on them and on you. Um, Drew says, I filed the AOS with the 485J with my previous employer, and now I got an RFE from the field office asking for the employer's letter confirming the job offer and other details. Do I need to send the 485J again? Um, so I see this a lot from the field offices especially. I think they're not um, up to date on the 485J because before the 485J existed, we always would bring an employer letter of support to the 485 interview to show that the job offer continued to exist. So they're asking for a letter, I would give them a letter. Don't just resubmit the 485J again. It should be simple enough to get, um, assuming that that job offer is still available to you. A uh, question that comes from Arpit is that there are a few days of overlap between the old employer and current employer. Will this be a problem? Yes, it could be a problem. You should contact an immigration lawyer. There are some practical solutions for it, though. Um, Abu Bakar says, as EB2 India has progressed faster, what do you think about EB3 India? Is it going to progress as well? I don't think so. And the reason for that is the reason EB2 India gets to progress more is not only do they get the extra green cards that um, didn't get used for family based last year, which EB3 got the same proportion of those, but EB2 also gets the spill down from EB1. So EB1 got all those extra family green cards in the same proportion as EB2 and EB3. They're not going to use all of those extra green cards. They don't even use up all of their regular green cards. So all of those spill down to EB2. EB2 already had the extra and now they're getting extra from EB1. Those extra from EB1 all go across to India because they're the oldest priority date, longest pending cases. EB3 does not get that same spill down because EB2 uses all of those up. There are that many people in line. 
So although EB3 did get some extra green cards, they don't get the extra extra that came from EB1 down to EB2. Hitendra Patel, uh, he recently upgraded from EB3 to EB2, 485J approved, uh, they approved, but the 485 status says that um, there are not enough visas available prior to date is March 2013. You should uh, contact the Ombudsman's office though, because your prior to date is current and you got the 485J supplement also to prove that thing. Uh, so that they can correct as if that your visas numbers are available, especially if your priority date is March of 2013. Um, Nova says, can I file the EB2485 when I am on AOS on EB3485? I have two I-140 approvals and have the EAD and AP on the EB3485. So you can file a second 485 based on the EB2 approval, but in order to do that, you need to be in a non-immigrant status. So if after you filed your EB3-485, um, you let your non-immigrant status expire or you used the EAD or you traveled and entered on the AP, then you cannot refile until you get back into a non-immigrant status. In that situation, if you can't refile, enter filing to transfer your pending 485 from EB2 to, EB3 to EB2 is still an option. A uh, question that comes um, uh, from Pavan Pavilara. Um, my case has been transferred to NBC from Texas. How long will it take to get the GC? I would say any time uh, now, um, but can I give you, uh, you know, the cases that have been transferred, are there cases that have been transferred more than six months ago that are still pending with the National Benefit Center? The answer is yes, uh, they're still pending. Some of the cases are pending, but uh, we see in general those, uh, uh, the adjudication is much faster when the case moves from Texas to National Benefit Center. It's just like you got the ticket for the show, but we don't know when the show begins. Um, but if you are still stuck in Texas and Nebraska, you still did not get a ticket for the show. But yeah, we don't know when the show begins. Uh, Mochi says, my wife's H4 is pending for more than 13 months at the Vermont Service Center. H-4 is already expired, filed two service requests, still waiting, called USCIS representative, any recommendations? Um, well, you can seek assistance from your congressman or senator if the online case status is showing that it's outside normal processing time, which I'm guessing it does, because otherwise they wouldn't have accepted your service request. You can also submit a DS DHS 7001 uh, request for ombudsman assistance. Um, but th for those, they tend to be focusing more on um, urgent kind of life or death humanitarian type of situations and maybe not so much on uh, long pending extension requests. Or you may want to look into, assuming your spouse's H-1B has already been extended, um, you could look into the margarita switch that we were talking about earlier um, by traveling to Mexico and coming back showing your spouse's H-1B approval notice that's been extended that would get you a new I-94 that extends your H-4 status that way. Um, AT says, I filed the 485 in April 2022, got all the receipts and the biometric appointment. Does it mean my case is documentarily good? There's no such thing as documentarily qualified with USCIS for adjustment of status. That term comes from the State Department and they only use it for consular processing. So here, um, just because you got the biometrics and the receipts, no, that doesn't mean you're documentarily qualified. They are gonna still look at your um, birth certificate, your marriage certificate, your medical exam, your status documents. If there's any police issues, they'll want those documents. So depending on whether you submitted all of that, will then determine whether your actually documents are good. Karthik uh, uh, has refiled instead of interfiled. Both applications are in National Benefit Center. Do we suggest withdrawing the EB3 application that has been transferred to NBC? No, don't do that. Uh, what we notice is that when you try to withdraw one application, they don't withdraw that one. They will withdraw the other one. It happens so many times. When we want them to do something and if they ever act, they don't act properly. So please don't do it. Uh, don't do it. Have both applications pending. It's okay. Once they approve your EB2, they will administratively 
close EB3 applications. That's what happening with the refiled cases. So I would not voluntarily withdraw. They may actually withdraw your EB2. Um, Deepak wants to know which DOL center is better um, for filing the PERM labor certification to avoid a long waiting time. My company is filing in Texas. Will that go to Texas or Nebraska? DOL only has one center, the Atlanta National Processing Center, which is no longer in Atlanta. They're in Washington, D.C., but that's filed online and they all get processed the same. No difference based on where you're located, no difference based on where the company is located. It's all first in, first out. DOL really is first in, first out. So nothing you can do on that front. Um, I'm applying an H4. Uh, can I still work on H1B till I get the confirmation? Uh, of H4 and can I reduce my hours while H4 is pending? Good question. Um, first of all, while the H4 is pending though, since your H1 is still active, you can continue working full time. But if you want to cut down the hours though, you have to file a H1B amendment because if the H1B says 40 hours, you're working 10 hours though, then you, you can't work on H4 because you don't have the H4 EAD. And if you want to work on H1B, you have to file an amendment. Um, Bhushan wants to know, can we schedule an H1B visa interview in a different country? Um, so pre-COVID, yes, you could if you had a reason to be in that country. Most countries were accepting what we call third country nationals. Since COVID, no, I've not come across anyone who's been able to get an appointment in a different country unless there were some sort of humanitarian issues like Ukraine or Afghanistan or things like that. Um, but generally, no, because the consulates are so backlogged, they're only working on helping their own citizens first and don't have any slots left for third country nationals. Um. Gopi Ravi got H-1B approved as a vice president, technical, going for stamping, no direct or project work with employer clients. Any suggestion though? This vice president titles, I don't like them even though they're technical though. Um, I don't know if you would like to change your position to some other position because when they see the vice president, there are it rings a bell for, the, bell for them, oh, this is something that we don't see and you're giving extra chance for them to scrutinize though. Yeah, you may be able to satisfy them, look, I'm a technical guy, it's the vice president role. Um, yeah, well, I, I would file an amendment for you, go with a different position if you can change your position though. Um, Abid says the EB2 to EB3 downgrade was filed as an amendment because the company got acquired. Can we do a successor of interest as a new I-140 under EB2 and then interfile? Um, so you can file um, again an EB2 using the same labor certification, but because it's a successor in interest, it is supposed to be done as an amendment. So you can have your company file the, a new EB2 amendment using the same labor certification, providing the successor and interest documentation. And then in that I-140 petition, you can actually ask them, let them know you have a pending 485 and instruct them to transfer your 485 to this new I-140 upon approval. Or after it's approval approved, you can send in the regular interfile through the Western Form Center address. Uh, Santil, 485 submitted based on the EB1C I-140 receipt notice while pending it. NBC, I've completed my fingerprint loss week. May I know when I can expect my EAD? Uh, since it's pending in NBC, which is a little bit faster though, uh, anywhere between two months to 10 months from the time you file the 485 is when you can expect the EAD in advance for all. Um, Simpson said he filed the EB1C I-140 along with the 485 and 131 in April 2022, and it's in the Texas Service Center. So L1A is expiring in December and he wants to know, can I hope to get my advanced parole before that or should I file for the L1 extension? Well, you have some time to decide, but based on current processing times, I would say at this point, plan to extend your L. You can wait until maybe November and see what the processing times are then um, and then file it. I wouldn't wait too close to December. It's good to try to get the extension approved before your current L1 expires. It's not mandatory to do that, but that is a benefit if something goes wrong with your L1 extension. You want it to happen before your current L1 expires so you can refile if necessary. 
Maki Bola from YouTube says that he is not seeing any H4 approval in the past one month based on some whatever tracker that he uses. Now we do see H4 approvals, but are they going at a faster pace? No, we don't see that. But they are adjudicating the H4s right now. It's not that they are not adjudicating the H4s. Um, our Mardeep says, I have the PERM labor certification approved for EB2 in 2013, but to due to some mistake by the attorney, my EB2 I-140 was rejected, but the EB3 was approved. Now I would like to resubmit the I-140 for EB2 for interfile. Is it possible? Maybe. I really would need to know what that mistake was, because if it's something about the language on the PERM, such as some bad Kellogg language, for example, that can actually take what would normally look like an EB2 perm and render it impossible to use for EB2. Um, so if it's that kind of mistake, I think you're risking um, your EB3 approval by trying to go in EB2 in that option. You might need a new perm to get into EB2. If it was just rejected because they you know, didn't fill out the form right or the check was wrong or something like that and they just decided not to resubmit it, then you have the option, but it, I have a feeling it might be the first, not the second. Pavan from Facebook has this question. Does the 485J supplement has to be filed only for primary applicant? What about the spouse? Uh, no, you don't need to file a 485J supplement for the spouse. However, though, when we file the 485J supplement for the main applicant, we also request in a letter, covering letter, saying that the spouse's EB3 also should be moved to EB2. We send that letter covering both the family members, but there is no 485J supplement for the dependent. There is none. Um, Shashi wants to know, how long should I stay with my current employer after the I-140 approval and what happens if I switch early? Um, so the general rule is that if you want to be able to use this I-140 approval to get continued extensions beyond the six year limit of your H-1B or for your spouse to get H-4 EAD extensions, you need to wait 180 days before you leave because if it's withdrawn within 180 days after approval, although you get to keep the priority date, you cannot use that I-140 to keep extending your H-1 and your spouse can't use it to get H-4 EAD. If you don't need that, maybe you already have an I-140 approval from another company, then the 180 day rule may not be as important. The other point is if your 485 is pending, then you have 180 days after your 485 is pending, regardless of when the I-140 was approved, and then you can switch. Uh, Arya has this question. Green card was going to be returned to USA, but I was able to pick it up from USPS before they send it back. Now I have a card, but now USPS thinks that the card is returned to USCIS and will be destroyed if I don't update my address. How can I correct this? Uh, you can raise a service request. You can see if the service request will be accepted. That's one thing. Write a letter to them saying that, look, I have the green card. I got it. So that's another thing that you can do. I'm not expecting much problem for you just in case if they think that the card is destroyed according to their records and you still use the card. Is there a chance that they're going to deport you or do something? I don't think so. I don't think so that will happen. You may have to spend an extra half an hour when you come in this and go to secondary inspection. That's all the most that I can expect though. Um, Biji Dara says, if a case is outside of the processing timeline, what options are there apart from Congressman's office, Ombudsman's office, and a service request? Well, assuming it's not a 485, um, litigation would be your other option in order to um, basically under the Administrative Procedures Act, the APA, the Congress has set forth a, in a statute, which is a law, that says that any time a person is dealing with a government agency, that government agency has to respond to you in a reasonable period of time. And if it's outside the normal processing time, that would suggest it's unreasonable. And you can use the courts to enforce that and seek USCIS to hurry up and um, adjudicate the case. Now it doesn't, litigation doesn't force the approval to happen, it just forces a decision to happen if the judge agrees that it is not a reasonable processing time. Uh, uh, Vorsi 2001 has this question. Um, do we know the pending 485 applications by the country wise? Unfortunately not. Uh, once the Trump administration come in, they start publishing those 
uh, based on the country, their priority date and all those things. I don't know why they are hiding that information that was obviously easy to publish. Um, hopefully Biden administration reverse the policy, uh, but right now we, they're not publishing that information. It's only, um, uh, they're not publishing, they're only uh, publishing how many 485s are pending, not by the country basis. Um, Ashwini, uh, once the RFA has been responded, how long it's going to take for the I-140 to be adjudicated? It, it may take anywhere between three weeks to three months. That's the normal time that it takes once the I-140-485 uh, RFA has been responded. Um, Shadjujan said, if my attorney didn't submit my medicals with my 485, I didn't receive any RFE for the medical and was wondering if there's a way we can submit the medical without an RFE. Yes, it's also called interfile, but don't get that confused with the other interfile that goes to this Western Form Center address in California. If you go to our website, rnlawgroup.com, and in the little search box, search for medical or interfile, you'll find an article that describes how you can do that. It's very simple. Um, you just send it into the service center where your application is pending and ask that they interfile it, meaning put it into your file, so that you can, um, the, that you can avoid getting that RFE. Now, will you still get an RFE? Possibly. It's possible these things cross in the mail, or it might take some time for them to get your medical actually into your file. Um, so you might want to get two copies of the same medical, two originals in two sealed envelopes, send one in an interfiling, keep the other one with you in case you get an RFE. That way you don't have to go back to the doctor and get it again. Uh, Rajni Gupta has this question. Uh, she sent um, uh, I-134 for B2 visitors for the parents, does the I-134 harm in any way? No, I don't. Uh, especially if you are sending it for your parents, I don't see any problem whatsoever at all. Uh, do you see any cases where NBC has pending EB3 approved and interfile approved EB2? No, we have not seen that. Uh, maybe um, we didn't file it, we told people to get an I-140 approval, but I also have, we also have a daily conference call if you guys want to join. We get the information from there. We also get, uh, read the post that you guys posted here. Uh, so as of now, no, we did not. We always recommended people to get the I-140 approved under EB-3 before they put the porting of the date from EB-3 to EB-2. Um, Center says the primary 485 is approved, derivative is still pending. What would be the status of the derivative? Because the primary is no longer maintaining the non-immigrant visa. What action can we take other than waiting? Um, so yeah, assuming the derivative was also a dependent of your non-immigrant visa, like you as the principal were on H-1B and your derivative spouse was on H-4, your spouse is no longer in a non-immigrant status since you're no longer in yours. But your spouse is lawfully present in the U.S. based on the pending 485. We call it adjustment of status. That's what their status is right now. Your spouse can work using the EAD and travel using the AP. And it's just a matter of time before their 485 gets adjudicated. There's not really much you can do to follow up unless it's outside the normal processing time. Then you can submit a service request with USCIS. Deepika, some interesting debates that we can discuss about, Emily. Uh, do you think so that the EB2 final action date will be retrogressed in September, October of 2022? I'm, my assumption is that, hey, you know, there are going to be extra 100,000 green cards or 60 to 100,000 green cards coming in next year. What's your assumption? Though? Yeah, I don't expect it to. I think that they're going to hopefully use up more of these extra green cards this year, which clears out more people in line. So that when next year's 140,000 green cards come out, they plus, will be able to take more applications, which means they have to move the dates. Plus, you're going to get extra, again, from the family base, maybe not to the level we've had the last two years, but there should be some. So I don't think there'll be retrogression in Even if there is anything uh, for a period of October, November, but they will advance again in, in January or February mm -hmm. is my assumption, though. Uh, is that so I don't think so if there's a retrogression it's going to be a retrogression for a long period of time uh, I can see that if uh, the priority dates may retrogress in October of 2023 MB, because that's when 23 23 22. not 22 mm -hmm. um, what about this assembly what do you expect uh, 
the USCI is using up the entire 290,000 green cards that we have. Uh, one thing that is that in the past 10 days, we have seen an increase in the number of green card approvals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they've learned some lessons from last year, and I do think they have more intentions. They've made some changes that allow them to focus more on employment-based 485s, moving them away from the service centers to the National Benefit Center, utilizing the field offices. All the things that they've been doing seems to be working, maybe later than what we had hoped, but I do think they're going to be in a better shape this year compared to last year. So if there's any wastage, it's going to be much smaller than last year. Uh, Sharma T from YouTube has this question. I'm going to do interfiling from EB3 to EB2 prior date is August 2014. What are the chances of getting a green card? You have a chance of getting a green card now because your final action date is current. What are the chances? Depends on how fast they move. Uh, and it also depends on um, who your officer is. I mean, if your officer is active, uh, then you're good. If the officer is a very lazy guy, then it may take a long time for you to get a green card. But it's a good move that you're doing interfiling rather than not doing anything. Uh, some people who have been waiting in uh, on the wall to see whether they should do refile or interfile, I think so it's time for you to make a decision though. Uh, if you're not doing anything, I would strongly recommend to do interfile. Uh, if you want to do interfile or refile, that's up to you. But I would rather suggest do something rather than not, not doing if you have filed an EB3 and it's backtracked right now, backlog right now. Um, Abhijit says, can I travel to Canada by land and use automatic revalidation? Uh, so technically, yes, you can. Just know that if you're traveling by land and when you're coming back in, sometimes they don't give you a new I-94. They just say, well, you have an I-94. We're not going to give you a new one. Um, so if your purpose of your travel is to get a new I-94, you would want to do that by air to make sure that you get that on the way back. B2 Shah, he got his green card approved uh, and uh, 485J, this got approved after two months after the green card approved. Come on. <laughs> uh, should you take any action working for both original and new employer? Um, be, 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 uh, virtue, you don't have to do anything. You're good. Your green card is approved. Whether they approve the 485 uh, uh, AC21, you can ignore that completely. You are good. You can work for both the companies. Wish you best of luck. We may not be of any help for you uh, in the future, but uh, wish you best of luck. And please keep writing letters to the congressman because you still need to help your fellow beings uh, in getting their green cards. So we have seen a lot of uptick in green card approvals in the past two, two to three weeks. Hopefully so, the rest of the team who filed the 485s in October of 2020, whose final action date is current, should get a green card. Hopefully so, very soon. Um, Rama Devi says, I got to know through the chat with Emma that my 485 was transferred to the New Mexico field office, even though I'm in Texas. Is this normal? Yes, this is normal. We're seeing it quite a bit. Um, and it's actually a good sign because New Mexico might not be as busy as Texas or any of the other um, field offices. They're choosing which field office has availability to take the case and adjudicate it quickly. Um, so it also likely means you're not going to be interviewed because they're not going to expect you to go to New Mexico for your interview. Um, so it should be a good sign. A uh, question that comes from uh, Ajay. Uh, the priority date is November 2015. Do you recommend changing the job right now? I'm not going to say anything to you, Ajay, but I am not changing the job if my priority date is November 2015. Uh, I will make a decision in August or September of 2023 if by the time the filing dates doesn't become current. Um, Rocky says, can I use the GCEAD to work for two companies? Um, yes, you can. Now, the, the green card, you need to have a valid offer of employment that is similar either from the original company that sponsored you or for a similar job from a new company. And you can use your EAD to work for that new company or the original company or any other company. Um, no issues with that, as long as you still have the valid job offer that supports the green card process at the same time. Emily, Emily what's going on with Schedule A downgrade applications though? Yeah, good That's news with that. Um, USCIS initially was denying some, um, but they ended up reopening those and approving them. So we have not had any issues with 
the Schedule A downgrades. Now we're going back and upgrading them to EB2 now since the EB3 um, retrogressed. Uh, Ramya is asking this question, does all cases move to field offices for adjudications? Um, no, not all cases are moving to field offices to adjudication. National Marine Field Center has some officers who can adjudicate the application then and there itself. They don't have to move it to the field offices. The field offices is only to facilitate um, uh, foster approvals according to the USCIS. Uh, so not all cases are moving, but we see a good number of cases are moving to the field offices. Um, Harsh says, I relocated the home residence to a location within the MSA that's on the LCA. Do I need to file an amendment to work from home for a new client after relocating to the MSA? Well, your LCA is valid for the job that is listed on the LCA, for the salary that's listed on the LCA, and basically for the county that's listed on the LCA. So if you move within the same county and then start working from home instead of at the client site, as long as the job duties, job title, salary, everything else remains the same, an amendment is generally not required for that. Um, potentially, it may be necessary to amend if you're gonna be going for visa stamping, if the client has changed as part of that. Um, but if, if you're not going for stamping under the um, matter of Simeo guidance, it's not necessary. Uh, Sam is suggesting that, that he got his GC approved, he was trying to come back and advance parole, and the second level officer said no. He offered to take the I-551 I stamp on passport. Um, definitely getting an I-551 stamp on the passport is much safer than traveling in advance parole, Sam. But you did not tell me that you have been denied and sent back. You're still, you still came into the United States, though. Yes, that's a hurdle that you have to face when you're trying to travel in advance parole when your green card is approved. The better way, yeah, you're right. Uh, the I-551 stamp, people can make a info pass appointment uh, and then get the I-51 stamped in the passport and that still is available. That's a very good option though, but a lot of people, they just want to travel uh, immediately. They may not have enough time to make an appointment with USCIS and get the I-551 stamp in the passport. Um, v says, are we allowed to file the H-4 EAD renewal based on an I-140 approved by the old employer when the new employer has not filed the PERM yet? Yes, you are, as long as that old employer did not withdraw the I-140 approval, or if they did withdraw the I-140 approval, it was more than 180 days after the I-140 was approved. You can always continue to use the old I-140 approval, regardless of where the green card process is with the current employer. Yuktesh has a good question, uh, though he, Child is locked in EB3, they're speaking about Child Service Protective Act, um, but now the child is above 21, can interfiling EB2 as its date is current, is the child protected per CSPA? No. No. Um, you need to look into if child is independently qualified now under the EB2. Because the child is aged out, there is a good possibility he may not be covered under EB2. So before you uh, file interfile, you need to look into how long your I-140 has been pending and don't do any steps until you consult a lawyer to make sure that the child is also protected in a CSP. Because what if your EB2 has been pending for one and a half year uh, and your child aged out only six months ago? So uh, there are some uh, times they may still be protected in the CSP under EB2. So we need to look into that very detail. Don't do the interfiling unless you're absolutely sure that the child is covered under EB2. All right, well, I think we're about out of time for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, don't forget that we do have a daily conference call and you can get the schedule for that at uh, rnlawgroup.com where you can get more, more questions answered there. And um, you can always uh, subscribe to our newsletter at rnlawgroup.com or as well as my blog at immigrationgirl.com. Thank you very much.